Well, this is our title for this chapter today, Joseph from the prison to the palace. And we, in previous weeks, have looked at Joseph's adversity as he was wrongly accused and thrown into prison and spent some number of years there. And here he's promoted to the palace. Before we look at this chapter, I wanted to give you a little background on the land of Egypt because it kind of bears on what's going on here. After the Tower of Babel, which we believe because Genesis is written as an historical narrative, we believe that really happened and the nations were scattered after the division of languages. And one of the sons of Ham, whose name was Mizraim, uh, his descendants ended up in the area that we call Egypt today. Now, the Greeks renamed that land Egyptos, and that's where we get our word for that land, Egypt. But the original name was Mizraim. In fact, in your Bible, everywhere it says Egypt in your Bible, if you look at the Hebrew, it actually says Mizraim. And if you go over to Egypt today, the Egyptians call their land Misra. So that goes all the way back to Babel. How about that? So who was this Pharaoh before whom Joseph was standing? And that's a, an important question because it really makes a difference on what's happening here. And here's the facts. We know that he appointed Joseph, who was a non-Egyptian, second in command in Egypt. That's almost inconceivable. He welcomed Joseph's family. We'll read about this later. A family of shepherds and gave them the best of the land. Again, hard to reconcile. And he made Joseph ride in the second chariot. There is evidence, both in the Bible and in the archeological record, that Joseph was in Egypt during the Hyksos dynasty. These were not Egyptians. They were uh, people from uh, the north, from Canaan. They were Semitic. These six Asiatic kings in succession were the 13th dynasty in Egypt, and this was the first time that Egypt would be ruled by non-Egyptians. It wouldn't be the last time, but it was the first time. Here's a little outline of the early history of Egypt, the early dynastic period uh, in which the descendants of Misraim ruled fairly loosely. The Old Kingdom, now all, all of the... Uh, periods that are called kingdoms here were marked periods that the rulers ruled over all of Egypt. In between were these intermediate periods in which there were rulers that ruled over part of Egypt. But the old kingdom is best known for all the big pyramids that we see over there today. They built like crazy and it's believed that that crumbled because they were bankrupt because of overspending, and so we have the first intermediate period followed by the Middle Kingdom, and one of those pharaohs is the pharaoh before whom Abraham appeared. And then you have a second intermediate period, and these were not Egyptians. And this is the pharaoh before whom Joseph appeared and Israel would come and uh, make their home in Egypt. So here are some points that help us uh, lean that direction, that these were Hyksos uh, dynasty and Hyksos pharaoh. The shepherds were loathsome to the Egyptians. If this was an Egyptian pharaoh, um, Jacob's or, or Joseph's family would never have been received so favorably in Egypt. But this pharaoh, it says in Genesis 47, we'll get to in upcoming weeks, this pharaoh had livestock himself. The Pharaoh in Genesis gave to Joseph's family the best of the land. That is the land of Gosham, which is right at the Nile Delta there. Very fertile, plush land. And um, a, a Egyptian Pharaoh would never have done that. Here's an interesting thing from archeology. span 
we're told in this section here, chapter 41, that, that Pharaoh promoted Joseph and Joseph would ride in the second chariot behind uh, Pharaoh's chariot. Before the Hyksos, there were no chariots in Egypt. They were introduced by this uh, band of invaders who took over Egypt for uh, several years. And um, this is the Pharaoh before whom Joseph appears. So Joseph, a non-Egyptian, could only have come to prominent position under a non-Egyptian Pharaoh. That's fairly obvious from the text. And uh, native Egyptians would never have promoted him to such a high position. This just fascinates me because we see here God sovereignly working over empires and kings and rulers. One king is put down and another is raised up. And all this to make way for his people during this drought, which, by the way, God is sovereign over droughts, that God would bring his people into Egypt and there he would grow them. And they would multiply like crazy. He would grow them. And also, uh, there is another purpose in all this that we would see at the Exodus. God would send them out of Egypt back to Canaan. And that would happen through the ten plagues that we see in Exodus to judge the false gods of the Egyptians. So there are many purposes. Those are just a few that we can identify. God has uh, many purposes in the things that he does, and his ways are quite mysterious, aren't they? Uh, I think of Daniel's statement in Daniel 5.21, the most high God is ruler over the realm of mankind, and he sets over it whomever he wishes. That's what he did here. He sent this band of Hyksos foreigners, took over Egypt, um, they're more than happy to give away Egyptian land to people or to promote a non-Egyptian to power. That would never have happened under native Egyptian rule. We've said it before, we can say it again. History is his story. Here's our outline for this morning in chapter 41. We'll look at Pharaoh's dreams, Joseph's interpretation, Joseph's promotion, and then the famine itself. So let's look at that first one there, Pharaoh's dreams. Pharaoh had two dreams, remember? He dreamed, first of all, that there were seven fat cows eaten by seven lean cows. A weird dream to have if you're a Pharaoh. He woke up and then went back to sleep, and he dreamed that there were seven full ears of corn, or your translation might say grain, that were swallowed up by seven thin ears. And Pharaoh woke up in the morning and he's, he's just troubled. Now, again, we talked about dreams last time. There was no written word at this point in redemptive history. And these people especially put a lot of stock into their dreams. Can God speak through dreams? Well, clearly he can because he did. But we would say today, at this point in history, we have something better than dreams. The Bible says we have the prophetic word made more sure. What do we have? We have the written word of God. The whole counsel of God, we call that a closed canon. That is to say God's not adding any more scripture to the Bible. He's given us everything in those 66 books that we need for life and godliness. The whole will of God for you in this life is in that book. Read it, because there is God's plan for you. But these people didn't have any of that. And so God, we know, was speaking in audible voices. He spoke to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in such ways. He spoke in dreams and visions and so forth. And the Egyptians were very much into the occult, and they assigned a meaning to all their dreams. Well. You shouldn't trust all your dreams, but sometimes, in this case, God spoke to Pharaoh. God was speaking in this dream. Pharaoh sent for the magicians, magi, and wise men, and they couldn't interpret it. Why, why is that? Because the dream was from God. They were trained in the occultic arts, 
And this dream was not from the occult. It was not from the enemy. It was not from the devil. It was from God himself, and they didn't have a clue. That tells us a couple things. The devil doesn't know everything. Satan doesn't know everything. These magicians and wise men could not interpret the dream. So two years had passed. Remember when Joseph interpreted the dream of the cupbearer. He's called a butler in some translations. I don't know if they had butlers back then. I think of something totally different than a cupbearer when I hear that word. But he interpreted his dream and he was restored to power just as Joseph had interpreted. And Joseph says, remember me when you get out of here. Talk to me, talk to Pharaoh for me and tell him that I'm, I've been wrongfully accused. Well, the cupbearer didn't do any of that. And Joseph just languishes in prison for two years. This is a young guy. And it would be so easy just to give in to pity and sorrow, maybe even anger toward God. But he didn't do that. He showed himself to just be an example in, in Potiphar's house. He was sold into slavery, and he's a, he's a model slave in Potiphar's house, so much that Potiphar put him in charge over his whole house. And then his wife tries to seduce him, and he resists. He does what is right, and she wrongfully accuses him of rape, and he's thrown into prison. From the time he was sold into slavery to the time he's promoted, get, gotten out of the prison, standing before Pharaoh were 13 years. He was 30 years old, so almost half of his life was in this great adversity. How would you respond to that? How do you respond to the trials in your life? You just get mad, get bitter. Well, Joseph didn't give in to that. Listen, Christian friends, we can't allow ourselves to throw pity parties. Your testimony is on display before the whole world. When you feel bad, when you feel horrible, your body aches. Maybe your heart aches because of so much turmoil in your life. Run to Jesus Come before the Lord. Pour out your case before him. He already knows about it, but here's the thing. He's allowing adversity in your life for a lot of reasons, and one of which is to get you to talk to him more. That's a sad commentary on our human condition that we need adversity to talk to God. How about this? Let's just try this on this week. Is everything going pretty good in your life? Why don't you just... Talk to the Lord every day and fill your mouth full of praises and thanksgivings. How are you doing in that? Because that's important. God wants to develop a dialogue with you and half of good communication is, is you talking to the Lord. So talk to him. Don't just bring your laundry list of prayer requests before him, but fill your mouths your hearts and your minds with praises and thanksgivings. And that's, that's so important. I think if we bathe every new request, prayer request, in thanksgiving for what God has already done for us, we'll find more effectiveness in our prayers. I think it's Psalm 50 that says, he who offers a sacrifice of thanksgiving honors me. I mean, that's a big deal. You want to honor God? Give thanks. And listen, American Christians, and Chooks just busted me this morning in adult Sunday school. He says, you're always picking on American Christians. It's like this everywhere in the world. I, uh, okay, you're right, Chooks. <laughs> but American Christians, for the most part, are so affluent. We have so much, and we're, we're so entitled. We feel like we deserve all this. You want what you deserve? Do you really? No. No, you don't. 
The wages of sin are what you and I deserve. We don't want what we deserve. We, we don't want our wages. We want grace. If you have, and there's people today living on this planet that have nothing and are probably more thankful than you. So let's give thanks, American church, for all of our creaturely comforts. We have so much. Let's give thanks, American church, for all of our spiritual blessings because we have everything, every spiritual blessing in Christ. You are so blessed. God, forgive us for complaining and times of bitterness and just withdrawing into depression because we're not getting our way. Nobody understands me. Nobody gets me. Listen, turn your eyes upon Jesus. I know life is hard. But you're, the way you respond in trials is being watched by unbelievers. What does the Christian do? when they lose their job or they get a bad diagnosis from the doctor or a child leaves them, forsakes them, won't talk to them. How does the Christian respond? Well, we cry, we grieve, but not as the, uh, those who have no hope. With every sheer uh, tear that you shed is a, is a sparkle of victory that God is causing all things to work together for your good and his glory. So here's where your testimony is really put on display before the world. God wants to make you a trophy of his grace as you praise the Lord that he's in control, that he is good even on your worst days. Then the world sees something different in you and me and that, that's what we got to show them. Is there something different in you? Do you have something to show? Give glory to God. Praise the Lord on your darkest days. And I say that's when your testimony shines the brightest. So two years pass by. This poor Hebrew young man is in prison. Forgotten but not forsaken. And then finally the cupbearer. Oh yeah. Hey, there's this there's this Hebrew kid in your prison who can interpret dreams. He interpreted my dream, and it came true. And so Pharaoh calls for Joseph. But Joseph had to wait and wait and wait for 13 years. Wait for the Lord, Christian. Be strong. Let your heart take courage. So here's the interpretation. I'm just fascinated by how quickly Joseph responds. I mean, God's speaking to the mind of Joseph to give him the interpretation. And immediately this well-orchestrated plan on how to get through this drought. But Joseph deflected all glory. He said, interpretations belong to God. He said that to the baker and then here before Pharaoh, Pharaoh says, I've heard it said that you can interpret dreams. And Joseph said, nope, I can't. But God can. Christians, we, we need to get better at when, when someone compliments you, you, you can thank them, but point them to the Lord. Well, listen, I appreciate those are kind words, but, you know, if anything good comes out of me, that's, that's the Lord. That's our testimony. Because you know you what you were without Christ. And now God's using you to do good things and help people and encourage others. And when that happens, give him the glory. You're so nice. You're so good. No, only God is good. Point people to Christ. Let him who boasts boast in the Lord. So Joseph interprets the dream. Seven fat cows 
and the seven full ears are, of corn are seven years of plenty. And then the seven thin cows and seven thin ears of corn are seven years of famine. Here's an actual ancient uh, grain bin in Egypt where they stored maybe the very things that we're talking about in Genesis 41. Joseph proposes this plan. Find someone, Pharaoh, that you'll put over the, the whole land of Egypt, and he can exact one-fifth of all the produce of every farm, and they'll store it up in the cities of those farms. And then that will be a reserve for the seven years of famine. Pharaoh is just so impressed by this young man. And again, young people, you can be a light to every generation. Don't think that, oh, I'm too young to make a difference in the world or in my church. You're not too young. You shine for Christ. Put those to shame who have been walking with Christ for many years and aren't really shining. Pharaoh said, can we find a man like this in whom is the divine spirit? And the, the Hebrew there is Ruah Elohim, which is the spirit of Elohim. And this Pharaoh talks about God in the singular, which makes us think, even though the Hyksos didn't worship uh, Yahweh, they probably were Baal worshipers, but they neither did they worship the pantheon of gods that the Egyptians worshipped. I thought before I was studying this week the Egyptians had maybe 10 or 20 different man-made deities that they had thought up. They worshipped over 2,000 gods. I mean, you can't fault them for not being creative. <laughs> wow! But this Pharaoh seems to talk, you know, God has given you the interpretation, singular. This is not an Egyptian Pharaoh. Anyway, here's our takeaway. Let, let your light shine. Jesus said this, that men might see your good works and glorify God. Just shine. Here, as the days get darker, they're, they're getting dark. They're getting ugly out there. All you have to do is stay the course. You keep shining and you'll look brighter because it's getting darker. So shine for Christ. If we act poorly in adversity, no one is going to ask us about the hope that lies within us. Remember, that's what uh, Peter says. Uh, be ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give uh, the uh, defense of the faith and the hope that lies within you. If we look, if our countenance looks just like the world, no one's going to say, hey, tell me about Jesus. No. So we got to shine. Pharaoh's so impressed by this young man, he, he promotes him on the spot. You've, have you seen the show Undercover Boss? <laughs> what? <laughs> the guy comes all dressed up as a janitor or something and um, just finds out what the people are doing in his shop and turns out, you know, he takes off the disguise. He's the boss of the company and says, you know, I'm so impressed by what you did. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring you on the uh, board of, uh, of governors for the company. Instant promotion. That's what this boss did. But he wasn't undercover. He gave to Joseph his signet ring. Signet ring was you, you stamp that into some wax. That's the seal of the Pharaoh. It has his authority. It must be done. He rode in the second chariot. And he was given a new name, which there's some d uh, difference of opinion on what that name means, but probably something to the effect that God speaks. And that's what God was doing through Joseph. He was speaking through Joseph. This Pharaoh recognized it, and he gave him this name. And he also gave him a wife, an Egyptian wife. 
Verse 49, Joseph stored up grain in great abundance like the sand of the sea until he stopped measuring it for it was beyond measure. And he had two sons. The first one was named Manasseh. God has made me forget is what that name means. You know, the Hebrews didn't just give catchy little names. Uh, They gave their kids names of what was going on in their life. And you just hope when you were born, something good was going on. (laughs) Otherwise, you got this Ichabod, you know, the glory has departed. Oh, boy, that's my name. And he had a second son named Ephraim. God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. There's There's a sermon just in the names of these two boys here. God gave Joseph, remember back, in chapter 37, God gave Joseph two dreams, that he would rise to prominence and his brothers would one day bow down to him and his brothers weren't too happy about those dreams. And Joseph wasn't shy about sharing them. There's a bit of pride in this young man, I think. So he he gives Joseph these dreams. Joseph believed they were true, that he was gonna rise to prominence. And immediately that's followed by 13 years of slavery and imprisonment. Those two things just don't go together. God makes promises to you in the Bible. And sometimes the circumstances of life don't match up to that. Which are you going to believe? Trust in the Lord. Circumstances are so variable. Even your feelings and emotions about things, don't trust in that. Trust in God. So Joseph's adversity prepared him for future ministry. He needed this. He was pretty proud when he left his brothers. That's why they got so upset with him. He wasn't toning it down. (laughs) You guys, you're going to bow before me. No, we're not. We're going to kill you. (laughs) They wanted to, right? And uh, Reuben stopped him. We've said this before, God will cause you to bloom where you are planted, but that's, that's not in every situation. You have to keep your eyes on the Lord. You, you feel like you're in the desert right now in your spiritual walk or in your job or in your marriage. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Don't blame your spouse. Don't blame your boss. Seek first the kingdom of God. That's what we just studied in our adult Sunday school. And all those other things, God will take care of those. Stop worrying about all that stuff and focus on the Lord, Christian. Paul writes, tribulation brings about perseverance and perseverance, proven character and proven character, hope. So all of this that's going on in your life is for a purpose and it's for a good purpose. Listen, I know I've said this, Chris Everidge is like, it's the 1,025th time he said this. God is more concerned for your eternal welfare than your short-term comfort. I'm more concerned (laughs) for both. You know, I want both. Well, unfortunately, our character is, we need adversity. We need trials in our life to drive us on and our sanctification. And those things produce perseverance, proven character, and hope. All right. So the famine begins after seven years of plenty. And Joseph, just as Joseph had said, the Lord did. The Lord says in Jeremiah, I am watching over my word to perform it. Every one of God's promises. If he said there's going to be a drought in seven years, You can take that to the bank. If he says in his word that whosoever believeth in my son will have eternal life, you can take that to the bank. You can put all your trust in that. You don't need a backup plan, a contingency plan. Trust in the Lord's promises because they're always yes and amen. They're always good. He's watching over his word. And he's every promise he's ever made. And you've never known anybody like this, but every promise he's ever made, he 
fulfills. So Joseph, uh, during the beginning of the years of famine, he opens up the storehouses. I, I got this picture of um, a mountain of corn. I think this is in Brazil, which is like Mount Trashmore size. So he opened up the storehouses. All the people of the earth came to Egypt to buy grain from Joseph because the famine was severe. All right. Here's our applications. Number one, wait on the Lord. We are so impatient, especially this generation. We are the ADD generation. We need to focus. Wait on the Lord's timing. His timing is not your timing. We want stuff right now. He's going to give it to you when it's perfect. Christians, beloved, you, you and I need to boast in the Lord a lot louder. Say something for Jesus Christ. I know the world thinks you're goofy when you do that. That's okay. You can say praise the Lord when something good happens at the checkout line. And people are like, oh, who said that? <laughs> we got to be louder about our boast in the Lord. And then finally, let your trials work for you. So um, I, I have um, just a little extra thing here for you, and then we're done. A foreshadow of Christ in Joseph. We looked at this at the first part of it a few chapters ago, but I mean, the parallels between the life of Joseph and the life of Christ are, are just amazing. Both are called their father's beloved son. They have the right of the firstborn, that is a double portion, rejected by their brothers, conspired against, sold for silver, falsely accused with two criminals. Remember Joseph in the prison, Christ on the cross? <coughs> One of those criminals received life. The other received death. Public ministry began at 30 for both of them. And then there's this pattern that's laid down, not just for Joseph and not just for Christ, but for all of us. The way up is the way down. If you want to be great in God's kingdom, learn to be the servant of all. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and he will exalt you at the proper time. And I, that proper time may not be in this life. And that's okay. If you just live for the Lord your whole life and nobody recognizes you, you're in nobody's who's who book, God knows and he will reward you. So just live for Christ. Live for his commendation, not the world's. So hum, humiliation and then exaltation, that's the pattern. So we should read the Bible Christologically. We're learning about Joseph here, but we're also learning about Christ. It's a picture, a foreshadow. Jesus said, the scriptures testify of me. Whenever you read the, the Bible, you should ask yourself, what did this teach me about God? What did this verse I just read teach me about Jesus Christ? Genesis, again, is not just history. It's his story. All right. Um, we don't have a closing song today. Um, so Chris is going to come up and pray for us, and then we'll be dismissed.